Hi there. Today uh, we've got an interview with uh, the named John Doe. He uh, does that to protect his name because uh, he's actually based in uh, Tokyo, Japan, and he's an anti-nuclear activist. Uh, he's uh, an American Marxist. He's a, a journalist. He's, he's a lot of things. Uh, he can be found on Freedom WB on YouTube and... Um, Basically, you just look for uh, John Doe, and uh, he will. He he has a lot of commentary that he puts up, uh, demonstrations and the like. Um, so, basically, without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, John Doe to the show. Hi, John. How's it going in Tokyo today? Oh, you know, uh, Tokyo as always. It's a, a good, hot, steamy summer night at the time of this recording. You know, uh, we're enjoying summer here. We're having it's a festival season right now. So we're having all that, you know, fireworks and drinking and all merrymaking. You know. Excellent, excellent. And um, I suppose I've got to sort of ask some questions. And, um, you know, I've sort of described who you are. You, you're a, like like a, ourselves. You're a blogger. You're a journalist. You're a researcher. Um, and you have some uh, consideration for the situation in uh, in Japan. Um, and we kind of met up uh, because of the Fukushima disaster and uh, trying to get uh, the information out where there was a lot of secrecy. Um, so I, I suppose I should say, you know, after all these years, uh, you've, you know, over four years now, um, how how has it been for you? I mean, I'm just going to bring it down to that. And how has it been for you? And... Um, uh, you know, in, on a personal note, as I said, your name's John Doe because you need to protect yourself. Uh, c could you fill us in a little bit about uh, that situation and, you know, uh, how you've got on over the years? You mean from a personal perspective? Yeah, from personal perspective. Uh, yeah, that'd be well. Weird. Well, you know, when it first happened, it was a very, um, to be honest, a very scary event. You know, I lived in Japan several years before it, before the whole earthquake in Fukushima happened, so I was kind of accustomed to minor earthquakes and things like that, you know. But to be honest, I would tell you the actual story, like where I was and what was happening the day it happened. I was, at the time, I was doing some English conversation type of stuff, right? It's where you, you show up to work and some people show up and you practice English with them. I do a different job now, but at that time I was doing So I had these three kind of like what you call in Japan um, – uh, housewives, you know, and we're doing the lesson. It's going through fine. Then we got a small shake. No big deal. We're used to that, you know. Then it started to get really intense. It was really hard shaking. I mean, the building started rattling. And then we knew that this is serious. So we all kind of like um, ducked on our tables. And the shaking got really intense. And the building was like weaving, bob weaving back and forth. And there was a moment, you know, where I just said to myself, this is the end. You know, I'm going to die, you know. And I put my head between my legs, and I was ready for that. And after about two or three minutes, the shaking stopped. And I thought to myself, God, I'm alive. I'm alive. I've survived this, you know. So we didn't really know what was going on. So the whole office, the whole school there is a wreck. Everything's falling on the floor. And the desks are over. The lockers are over. So we all get out. I say, let's guys. Let's get out of the building. So we get out of the building, you know, and we go on the street, and everybody's on the street. Like, everybody. And it's total chaos. And, like, um... The local retail places are holding, showing up the video on their TV screens, and we're seeing what's going on. And we see this massive earthquake going to hit Japan, and all these tsunamis are coming. You know, and everybody's like, what the hell just happened to us? You know, what are we going through? And we look at the train station, and there's a big old crack in the middle of the train station, and the trains have stopped, and everybody's on the street just bewildered by this, you know? Because in Japan, like I said, we're used to earthquakes. You know, earthquakes are something that we don't take all that serious. But this was something that was different. And I remember that, you know, we sent all the students home, you know. It was just me and the staff there, you know. And, and we were watching all the ma the chaos going on on the TV. We looked up the Internet, you know, seeing all the tsunami damage and all the crazy stuff was going on, the nuclear meltdowns. And we're all we're in Tokyo just thinking, you know, what is happening to our nation? This country that, you know, that is not my own, but I fell in love with and I call my home and... You know, the Japanese staff, you know, it's their home. They've been born here, you know, they're all just freaking out. And eventually, you know, to be honest, you know, <laughs> we gave up. And I went down to the local liquor store and got a fifth of Jinro. Jinro is Korean liquor, by the way. I got a fifth of that hmm. and picked up a bento, which we call a lunchbox. I picked up a couple of those and I fed the staff. We, we, you know, we cracked up that Jinro and had a couple of drinks. Watch all this going on. And 
there was another branch of the company I was working at, another school was very close by. And said, hey, guys, if you can make it over to us, we're all going to camp out here for the night. It was about 10 people over there already, a couple of students and the rest of the staff. So you guys make it over, you know, come on over. So, we, you know, we had our lunch, watched the rest of the chaos, and the trains were shut down, right? So you could get on the train tracks and walk. So it was like three stations away from where we were at. So we just got that fifth of general, got on the train tracks and started walking, right? So we walked all the way on those train tracks. It was an unheard of thing in Japan, walking train tracks, right? And where I'm from in West Virginia, walking train tracks is a normal thing. But in Tokyo, that is, you know, that just happened. But this is a unique situation. So we walk those train tracks, and we get on, get all the way over to the next, uh, these three stations away, you know. And we get there, you know, it's, we find out it's, it's just a bunch of women, you know. There's, you know, and we two, we two guys show up, and they're like, oh, thank God, you know. I don't know why, you know, but because I'm not a misogynist type of person. I'm not like a women hating person, but Japan's the way it is, you know. So what I had to do that night was basically secure the building and make sure the keys were okay and lock everything up and take care of them. And that was my that was my that was my first day with with the uh, earthquake and tsunami was trying to take care of people. And the next morning we woke up and the company said, "Nah, everybody go home." So the next morning, the trains were actually running in Tokyo. Believe it or not, then by like 9 o'clock, the trains were running. It was chaos. You know, I got on the train there, you know, and it took me like three hours to get home from like a normal 45-minute train ride. And I eventually got home there, you know, and my internet was working, but we still we didn't have phone service for four days in Tokyo. But internet was fine. You could use internet, but you couldn't use your phone. You didn't call anybody because it was so overwhelmed. And I just went home, got my got my PC there, you know, and just watched everything. And just every like five or six minutes, we get this hard earthquake. Like every five or six minutes, man, it was like boom, 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 boom. You get shook the shit out of you, you know. And that went on for like two weeks, two weeks of that. You imagine that, man? Two weeks. Every five or six minutes, you're getting this hard earthquake. You're getting like six point fives, you know, sevens. Every five or six minutes. That's the way it was for like two weeks in this country, you know. So that must so that's have been my very personal experience of how I, how initially it all went down, you know. And so that, maybe did that cause a lot of fear there. in the Japanese then? Uh, you know, there's a thing about Japanese culture, you know, that overall, you know, there's a, there's a thing in Japanese culture of being very kind of hardcore, being kind of stiff upper lip, you know. And I admire the Japanese for that. I've learned a lot from that, you know. Like people here. When, sh- when things get really bad, the Japanese tend not to say anything. They tend to do something. They react instead of, like, talking, you know. And people were freaked out. And I was on the train trying to get home at one the morning after, you know. I could see the look on everybody's faces. We all shared the same feeling that this is bad, you know. But no one said anything. They just kind of looked at each other, and we just, we just cooperated. You know, it's an amazing thing about Japanese culture that instead of freaking out and looting and being insane – people just knew that this is bad and you don't need to talk about how bad it is because we all know people just cooperated and they behaved in a very orderly manner you know so so i mean basically it's 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 obviously a really great quality that you describe but but yeah. in the terms of nuclear if we were going to jump onto that subject uh, basically mm. we could turn around and say that you know it's been a great hindrance when you have a, a sort of large uh, sort of um, uh, industrial accident like uh, Fukushima happened. Um, oh, it's in, terrible. In terms of people's uh, ability to confront the issue. It was very difficult. I mean, here in Tokyo, we didn't know what to do. All we knew to do was to get information. And for the first month, everybody just watched in Tokyo. Everybody kind of played it cool. You know, everybody just kind of got information, tried to figure out what was going on, deal with the shortage. We had, we had supply storages too in Tokyo. We had, and we're, lots of things we're doing with. So we just kind of observed and just watched what was going on. And, and in terms quickly, of the mainstream media in Japan uh, and around the world, you know, after about two to three weeks, they started censoring uh, any information well, about Fukushima. So censoring, censoring in Tokyo, there's a good censoring in Japan, right? Didn't happen after two or three weeks. The censoring didn't really go on until Shinzo Abe was elected to power. Right. You know, there's a misconception that the censoring went on immediately. No, it didn't. You know, cause, cause a lot, of, you know, a lot of people, you know, not to say anything bad, but you don't live in Japan. You know, you weren't getting the information that we were getting. Sure. You know, and at first we were getting the media was all over it, like stink on shit. To, not this use disparaging language, but it was kind of like that. You know, you had the uh, Asahi, 
Asahi Shinbom is kind of like the mainstream left-wing paper here. You know, Japan Times is the foreign gaijin paper, you know. You know, and they were all over it. The media here was mad about it. They were just like angry. They were forcing the government and TEPCO to give information to Really hard pressed them, right? And a lot of information came out with the first three or four months. That's right. It was like full blown. The media here was very impressive. Yeah. But after I, about I, a year, and a, but after about a year and a half, you know, we had this like far right wing fascist government come into power, and that changed a lot of things. And the reason that happened was because the Social Democrat Party, the Democrat Party of Japan, who was in power and all this went down. Kind of dropped the ball on it, right? They weren't organized enough. They weren't ready enough for this. And they got kicked out. And when Shinzo Abe came to power, that's when the censorship, that's when shutting down everybody, that's when the intimidation happened, that's when the violence towards protesters happened, that's when all that started. So make no mistake that the censorship was not immediate. It, it, it wasn't until the fascists here in Japan got in power that all that started to happen. True. To I mean, I have to say, I was in the UK and the censorship started after three weeks in the UK. Um, I heard about that. I heard a lot of Brits here in Japan were pretty adverse to hearing what the Japanese media was saying sure. compared to what the British media was saying. It was totally different. You know? Yeah, no, was, uh, and there was, uh, it, there was a, a local TV station that basically uh, uh, called, uh, I can't remember the name of it at the moment, uh, but basically uh, did a, a study uh, with uh, Mikonoro, who was uh, working in Chernobyl. Uh, Mickey Noro, yeah, yeah, that guy's an amazing person. Yeah, and uh, she she basically went on and she did a, a study, a epidemiological study, and she was finding nosebleeds, uh, various uh, uh, stomach problems and uh, headaches and uh, rashes and various other things that had come up mm. uh, about three three months after the uh, disaster. I did a lot of reports on that stuff in the first couple of years, mm. you know, and people often ask me why don't I don't keep doing those reports. And the reason why is, like, there's nothing more to say. Sure, sure. You know, it I is mean, what it is. I've made those reports. I've filed those reports and yeah. videos and writings across the Internet. Yeah. <laughs> and there's, what more can I say about it? The facts are there. Well, there is one thing I could, could get you to say, possibly, or talk about, is the fact sure. that... Uh, no, what I was going to say was, uh, was that the UNSCARE uh, did a report uh, about a year or which, so ago which, which, saying... Back up again. What is that? Which publication? Uh, the UNSCARE, uh, U-N-S-C-E-A-R, the <laughs> UN uh, radiation uh, sort of uh, safety. Oh, those clowns. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. <laughs> but it, it, in that group, there are some half-decent people that were trying to fight against the pro-nukes because uh, it's a kind of a mixed bag. But what they did, they had to agree on was that over 50% of Japanese food would be contaminated to some degree. So that might be very small amounts in their eyes. Um, and so therefore they would set the 100 becquerel standard because people were eating more of little bits of cesium. So they worked it out with, a, with a, an equation. Um, with that in mind, you know, how, how did you deal with the uh, food situation, trying to find clean what, what you might presume to be uh, clean food in Japan you know, in uh, 2011 and, and since, in fact? Well, that was a big thing I used to talk about a lot, too. Yeah. You know, in the first couple of years. You know, if you look back on some of the reports I did, I used to focus on that a lot, you know. And how I dealt with it personally, like, here in Japan, you know, people talk about the privilege to leave. Everybody talks about, well, why don't you just leave? You know, and these people, they must be Westerners, right? And they have the privilege to choose where they live, you know. But here in Japan, you know, we don't have no choice. This is our country. It's a home, you know. This is my adopted home, you know. It's not like I can pack up and leave. And I was really offended by all these people who said, just leave, just get out of there. I'm like, you know, buy me a plane ticket. You know, it's my home. It's where I live. I lived here for a long time. You know, I, I'm financially connected here. I just can't pack up and leave, you know. That just made me angry a lot of times. It frustrated me that people would say that to me, you know. But, you know, but what, how we dealt with it, right? We looked at the areas that were most contaminated, right? You got like Fukushima, you got Ibaraki. Those are the two most danger zones. And unfortunately, that's where the uh, large majority of rice in Japan is grown. Ibaraki and, and Fukushima, in that area. So when you go to the grocery store looking for rice, what we do, we go by harvest seasons, right? Now in Japan, when you go for rice, it's the previous harvest that comes out to market. Not the current harvest, right? So in Japan still, they put the area where the rice was produced at. Right? They have to. It's kind of a regulation. So I go looking for rice. I go look for 
the areas that are further away from the most contaminated zones. And that's where I buy my rice from. You know, as far as other foods, if it says Ibaraki or Fukushima, no way. Not eating it. I'm just, you know, those are two prefectures that are kind of like you don't eat from. Everything else, you just try to find furthest away from those prefectures that you can, and you do the best you can. If you got the money, you can afford it. You buy bottled water. You avoid Tokyo water because Tokyo water was proved to be contaminated with nuclear radiation within the first two days. And the government stopped talking about that pretty quick. You know, so that's how we deal with it. Basically, we look for the areas where we buy food to, that are furthest away from con- contaminated zones. Sure. You know? There's there's a question I have to ask you as well. It's a sort of medical one. Uh, mm. As you, as you were saying, when uh, President Abe came to power, he basically said that you know he he enacted various things. And there's one uh, article which mentioned the fact that uh, that he wasn't going to allow genetic uh, blood tests on uh, victims living in Fukushima and Miyagi and wherever um, because um, uh, because it, there was a blood test that they could do to see if there was any radiation damage to, to the blood. But it had to be done within three years. And in, mm. on the two and a half year mark, as the university in Japan was asking for these blood tests to be done, uh, Abe refused it on, on the count that um, basically that uh, it, it might find illegitimate children. Now, is this some sort? Of, <laughs> is this some sort of quirk I'm of sorry. Japanese culture? I'm sorry, dude. That's funny. Yeah. Oh my god! Really? Yeah. That's hilarious. I'm sorry. I, that cracks me up. Yeah. So <laughs> that, that was that was what he said, and then of course that was oh it. My it god. just it was just squashed, <laughs> right? Crazy stuff. Yeah, of course. That's just ridiculous. Yeah. Who the fuck? I'm sorry to use foul language again, but <laughs> Jesus Christ! <laughs> oh wow, that's, that's so Abe. Yeah. That's yeah. so Shinzo Abe that is, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's so right-wing Japan. All right. Oh. Why, why is his wife, uh, I mean, also there was a load of uh, Japanese activists, and they're largely women, uh, who decided that they were going to stop giving their husbands sex uh, if they... Okay, no, no, that's a recent thing. That's nothing to do with Fukushima. Okay, and, and do you think that um, Abe's wife, who's would, anti-nuclear, do <laughs> is doing it as well? Huh? Abe, you know Abe's wife is anti-nuclear? Yeah, strong anti-nuclear. If you want me to talk about the whole thing about women denying sex in Japan... Yeah, go for it. I, uh, I'm very I can, but it's not related to the nuclear. It's related to the last majorial um, election in Tokyo. The mayor, the current mayor of Tokyo, when he was running for election, right? That's a Mazui guy. Now, I'm not pronouncing him completely correct, but... <coughs> he said that women could not effectively serve in politics because they have a period. Okay? Wow. He said, because they appear, they become emotional and stable. That's not good for politics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, only in Japan could someone <laughs> say that shit and get away from it and get elected, right? Yeah. So when he said that, there's this huge movement in the metro area here in Tokyo for women to refuse any sex to a man they were involved in, but openly said they were going to vote for him. That's where that comes from. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah, I spent, oh, Japanese politics. There was an earlier campaign by uh, anti nuclear women uh, to do that. I don't know if it was very big, but maybe that was, uh, maybe that's what triggered this particular uh, campaign that, uh, of uh, women. That probably got the, got the idea started. It's more of a Spartan thing, you know? Yeah. The old, the old classic Spartan thing, you know, like until you finish war, we're not going to give you any loving. You know, it's just, uh, I thought that was very ingenious, you know, because the way the, the, um, the substructures in Japan are, are formulated, sure, that can have a very powerful effect if it's done the right way. Okay. But yeah, the, the the big movement from that came from that election of the, the Japanese, the, the Tokyo mayor. Right. That's where all that media hype came from. Brilliant. And that's why it was about, yeah. I'm uh, glad you bring it up because a lot of people don't even know that happened. There was okay. A, there was a Spartan movement. There was a Spartan movement. That, that went on, you know, so I'm glad you bring it up. Yeah, no, good one, good one. That was a good story to, to get to us. So, um, oh, yeah. I suppose, I suppose looking at it, you know, obviously I introduced you as a Marxist American, a kind of a rare breed indeed. Um, and I, talking about women uh, and women's equality and rights and uh, what have you, um, how, how does Japan shape up? And I, you did do one story on the lady with the vagina boat. And you did another story. The vagina, uh, vagina, the vagina art. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, and and is she in prison still? What's the deal there? 
it's a very interesting case going on. I know I did like a, I think I did at least three videos on her case. That's right. And now it's in the courts. Basically, the first time she was arrested. For those who don't know about this, so maybe I give some background on this, right? What she actually did was crossing a vague line of pornography and obscenity in Japan, right? There's a very vague line between art and trash in Japan, and the law is very vague on it, right? What she did was um, she started, she took a, um, a mold of her vagina and used it to make art, right? Which in most cases, Japan wouldn't care so much, but she pushed it. She took it to a step further. She made a canoe out of the shape of her own vagina and then took a ride in that can canoe down one of the central rivers in Tokyo. Not once, but twice, right? Now, that wasn't enough either. That wasn't enough to get arrested either, right? That wasn't enough. Then she, with a, um erotic store, we have erotic shops in Japan, which are not porn. Erotic shops in Japan are where we deal with the eureka of life and human society. It's art, it's um, kink, it's um, expressions of sexuality, but it's not a porn shop. It's hard Either you know what it's like or you don't. You've been here, you've been in one of those shops, or you don't. It's hard to explain. So her uh, partner in crime started selling some of her uh, erotic art using with the molds of her vagina. Like we're talking like a river. She used like, like a little like a sculpture of, of a river using her vagina, things like that. And the thing that got her arrested was um, she distributed the blueprint for the kayak, right? On the internet, so other people can make the same kayak and kayak and the motor her vagina. So she got arrested at the first time, and the cops basically told her like, "Don't do this again." The whole finger wagging thing over Japan. I've been arrested in Japan before, and usually the first time you get arrested, they usually like, kind of stop you on the hand and say, "Don't do this again, goddammit." Hmm. And that's let her go, right? But she said, "No, screw you guys. You know, I don't like the way you treat me. You know, you, you, you patriarchal bastards." So she did it again. She, she did another ride down the Central River in Tokyo in her kayak, you know, and he continues selling her erotic art, you know, and they arrest her again. The second time, they charged her with obscenity crime, violating the, the Japanese uh, pornography law, which says you cannot display open um, genitalia uh, in, in, in a uh, erotic manner, right? So they kept her in jail that time about two or three weeks. She said, screw you cops, I'm going to answer none of your questions. I've been interrogated by the police. I know what it's like. It's very intense, and it can be very intimidating. And she very stripped to him, and she got released the second time. You know, but part because of the media attention, that's why I let her go, because usually it's unheard of to get bail in Japan. Okay. It's unheard of. Japanese or Daijin, it's unheard of to get bail in Japan. If you get the cops snatch you up, typically you're in jail into your trial, into the duration of your trial. But due to the media attention, she got released Excellent. on a very small bail fine. You know, and now it's in the courts. And it's up to the lawyers because the system in Japan is different from what you may be used to. The trial, in, a trial in Japan is a show trial. It, it is meaningless. It's everything that happens before the trial in Japan. That's important. You're a bengoshi or your lawyer, right? What he does is he tries to negotiate the terms and conditions of the trial before the trial happens. So his best chance is to try to get the case dismissed. He tries to discredit discredit evidence before it's presented to the judge. They have a negotiation that goes on between the judge, the prosecution, and the, and the defense before it goes to trial, right? And they decide what's going to be permissible and what's not. So right now, that system, that process is going on right now. So that's where it is right now with her, right? So, I mean, that with the background to the fact that uh, we're talking, uh, we had Yume, Yumino Nito uh, with a discussion on the FCCJ channel, the Foreign Correspondents Club of Japan. I have a bit of contact with them, but I'm not really close to them, but yeah. Sure. But, but they, they did a, an interview with her, uh, or a, she did a statement uh, about helping high school girls escape Tokyo's sex industry, you know. Yes, yes, it's a big thing. I could tell you some, some tales about that. That's insane. Well, I mean, that, that might be useful because uh, as we're on that topic now, if you could, just a, a brief outline. Okay. That whole situation, we call it the, um, the Jose business, right? High school, <coughs> pardon me. <coughs> <clears throat> it's summer in Tokyo. You, know, you get congested. Um, the Jose business, right? That whole thing is a, will be very shocking 
to many Westerners, right? It's a huge industry. It's a thing where women are objectified to a point to where the younger you are, the higher your value in the market you are, right? That sounds very sick, right? But it's very true. Like, you take a 15-year-old um, girl in Japan. She can make a lot of money in Tokyo, right? There's different businesses that offer this stuff, right? Now, typically, no actually penetrative sex is involved. It usually involves like um, laying down with the girl, talking to the girl, watching the girl do everyday mundane things like read a manga or um, polish her nails. And if you pay extra money, you can do things like touch her leg or touch her arm or things like that. There's also the old uh, panty business in Japan, right? A lot of young girls will um, soil their panties through an erotic means. And they'll um, sell it to a distributor, and the distributor will um, sell those pennies to um, clients who want that. And those clients use that, they sniff it, they smell it, and they use it for their erotic pleasure. Uh, yeah, the Jose business is a big problem in Japan. Yeah. And also, That's... full-on sex does happen. That's a more uh, hardcore element of the business. It's usually carried out by the Yakuza, which you guys may know as Mafia, Organized Crime. The more hardcore, like, paid out sex to a 16, 15 year old girl that you cared about your act. So, yeah, that goes on here, you know. And just like maybe a year and a half ago, finally, possession of underage erotic pornography was made legal. Think about that. Just a year and a half ago. Wow. So, that, that's that. I can comment on That's what I say about that. Yeah. Maybe yeah. Insight on that shit. Sure. It's, it's a big topic, um, but uh, if it, it was well br briefed over. Thanks for that info, though. You know, it's, it's uh, good to get some background on, on these stories. Um, I'd like to sort of bring us to Okinawa now, just briefly, to maybe to finish off. Um, and uh, two Okinawan major newspapers were uh, threatened with censure, um, and we're sort of looking at the protests in Okinawa against the U.S. Uh, bases, and, of course, those newspapers supporting those, uh, those protesters and the mayor that got elected as well. Um, yeah. So could you give us a little bit of uh, a synopsis on what's going on there with that at all, uh, Joe? Well, well, first of all, like, the overwhelming majority of Okinawa people don't want the U.S. military there. They get the economic harm that would come from kicking the military out because they benefit a lot from uh, economically from having the U.S. military there, you know, tourism, food, all that, you know. But for them, it's more than that because... You're dealing with a group of people, ethnically, ethnically unique people called Ryukyu people. They're not Japanese, and they're not Chinese. They're kind of a mix culturally and ethically of Japanese and Chinese, all right? And for a long time, Ryukyu was not even a part of Japan. It was an independent nation, what they called a pirate nation, all right? And eventually they got taken over by the Japanese. There's a long history of that between the Chinese and the Japanese. I won't go into it now, but... Uh, these days, what they want, they want the U.S. military out. They don't like it. The noise, you know, the rapes of young women that go on in Okinawa, all that stuff. They're just sick of it, you know. They want to be more independent. They want more autonomy from Tokyo. You know, it, they just don't want them there. They just want them out. They want the U.S. military gone. Uh, you know, that's all I can say about it. You know, they, they, they're sick of it. They're sick of the abuse. They're sick of the harassment. They're sick of the, being ignored by Tokyo. They're sick of the rape of the women. They're sick of the whole damn situation. They just want people to, they just want the Americans to get out of there because the Americans are not doing overall nothing good for them, you know? Cool. All right. Well, uh, Jimmy, o over to you, mate. If, is there, is there uh, anything you'd like to add to this at all? Well, y yeah, I suppose. Um, well, there's lots of things I'd like to add, but I, I suppose we've got limited time. But, John, you were speaking uh, a little bit earlier about rice and food and how you'll source your rice from parts of Japan which have not been so badly affected by uh, nuclear radiation and and you were also saying like how people in Japan you know it's your home and, uh, it, and quite understandably so uh, people are not so inclined to move away but but considering the fact that like radioactivity is cumulative and it's it's into the water supply and everything would the right thing not be to do to get the kids out of there at least and uh, give them a little bit of chance to, to, to grow older and, 
so that um, because we know radioactivity doesn't affect the adults as so badly as it affects the children. So what what would you be your thoughts on on, on those couple of points? And okay, and well, also uh, sorry, and also bear in mind that like the uh, how long can you sort of like source rice which is before which has been grown before the, the nuclear accident? That I, I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Okay, well, that, that last point, right? What we had was a three-year um, backstock in Japan, right, of non-radiated rice, right? So we knew that. We had a three-year backstock in Japan. So what a lot of people did was mass buy rice. I did it myself. I bought, like, tons of rice. In my apartment, I had rice up to the ceiling, you know? So we did that a lot, too. That happened in the early days, the, the first two years, you know? But when you talk about the children, right, there's been a big movement among mothers in Japan to ask questions to the government. There's a big thing. I did a video on it uh, so a couple of years ago about this uh, lawyer. She was a woman. She had a child. And she told her child to refuse to drink milk. And I think it was Ibaraki you know, from a high school. Like, you know, mama said don't drink the milk. And here's what happened, right? Just to show you how disgusting. Because I'm, I'm a teacher myself, and I'm disgusted by what happened, right? This teacher pulled this kid out of class made him hold that milk in his hand. And he said to him, if you think you're not Japanese enough to drink Japanese milk, and you're too good to drink this milk, I want you to pour that milk in this bucket in front of all your friends and show how much you hate Japan and how much you won't drink this milk, this good Japanese milk. And the child broke down in tears and still refused to do it because mama said don't drink that damn milk. That's a situation with children have to deal with in this country, where their mothers are telling them common sense. But yet, you know, we have the institutions in Japan. These superstructures and substructures support the economic base, telling these kids to go against the will of their own mothers. You know, that's what children are facing in this country. Yeah. Well, they're well, facing because... the options. Yeah, they're facing the options, these children, of listening to their mothers who are wise and, only, and really love their children and want to take care of their children. But they go to these institutions who are forcing these children to go against common logical sense due to political convenience, you know. So talk about what the children are facing, that's what they're facing here, you know. Yeah, there's, we, we certainly have covered uh, uh, on the blogs, you know, children de uh, de uh, was it, um, cleaning up the uh, swimming pools in their schools, you know, they've been given steam clean. Yeah, that goes on too. That goes on too, you know. And, Telling the uh, kids, hey, just clean the pool and we'll swim in it. You know? And don't get us started oh, on that. thyroid cancers in children either, huh? Oh, the thyroid cancer thing. I've done a lot of research on that, man. It's just getting wild in like Fukushima and Ibaraki. Yeah. It's kind of out of control there for the kids doing, showing uh, um, thyroid growths. It's like so many kids are showing up with thyroid growths, right? And the doctors, he's paid off, like sold out doctors telling the kids, no, 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 it's fine, don't worry about it, your mom has no problem, it's a normal thing for a kid to have. No, it's not. It's not normal, medically, for a child to have a growth on, a, on their thyroid, you know? Yeah. That's a problem, you know? But we'll be coming to, back to that story, and I, I think this is a good point to, to leave the interview, and um, I hope you're going to come back to us, uh, John, uh, for more reports. Yeah. Anytime, you know, I'm more than happy to talk to you guys. I really enjoyed it, yeah. and I uh, really am gracious that you guys invited me to your show. I'm cool. Gonna, thank you so much. That's no problem, my friend.